Hi everyone, it's Professor Primitin. In this video, we're going to talk about one-to-one -one functions and their inverses. So in mathematics, we know many different types of inverse operations. We have addition and then subtraction because subtraction will undo addition and vice versa. And we also have multiplication and division. We also have roots and also exponents. Well, the inverse function is just a rule that acts on the output of a function and produces the corresponding input value. So you can think of inverse as it's undoing what the original function did. So if you have a value of x and you input it into a function, you will produce a y value if that x was in the domain of the function. Well, the inverse function is going to take that y value, treat it like it's an input value, and it will output the original x. It will undo what the function f of x did. However, we're going to find out really quickly that not all functions have an inverse function. Functions that have an inverse function are called one-to-one -one functions, and we're going to find out if a function does have an inverse, the inverse function is actually unique. There's only one of them for each function if the function actually has an inverse. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to determine whether a function is one-to-one -one because one-to-one -one functions are the ones that have inverses. We're going to actually verify inverse functions using composition. And then we're actually going to talk about how to determine the domain and range of an inverse function, including the domain restriction of a function to make it one-to-one. -one. So let's start with one-to-one -one functions. We're going to consider two functions, f of x and g of x, that have these two different arrow diagrams below. Notice that f of x is the function that's on the left. It maps 4 to 10, 3 to 7, 2 to 4, and 1 to 2 from the domain of f to the range of f. Notice that the function f of x never takes the same value twice. In other words, every single y value that's in the range of f of x, there is a corresponding x value, only one of them. So 4 only goes to 10, 3 only goes to 7, 2 only goes to 4, and 1 only goes to 2. Every single y value is used exactly one time. There's one corresponding x value for each y value. However, the function g of x, the one that's on the right, you have the function that takes 4 to 10, 3 to 4, 2 also to 4, and 1 to 2. Notice that the y value, y equals 4, actually has two corresponding x values. Now, keep in mind, the definition of a function was every x value corresponds to exactly one y value. Both of these are functions, but the property that we're really concerned about is the y equals 4 is actually used two times for two different x values, x equals 3 and x equals 2. This is what it means to be 1 to 1 for a function f of x or not 1 to 1 for the function g of x. A function where each output value corresponds to exactly one input value, that's what's called a 1 to 1 function. However, notice that if you have an output value that corresponds to more than one input value, then it's not one-to-one. -one. y equals 4 corresponds to two different input values for the function g. It was x equals 2 and x equals 3. So the definition of one-to-one -one function, a function with a domain a is called a one-to-one -one function, or it's abbreviated 1-1 one -one for one-to-one, -one, if no two elements of a, so no two x values or input values, have the same image or output value. So in other words, a function is one-to-one -one if the y values are different means the x values must be different. So if f of x1 is not equal to f of x2, that means x1 cannot be equal to x2. Two different x values must go to two different y values. And so you can think of this in terms of a graph as well. A horizontal line that actually intersects the graph of f of x more than one point then we're going to see very quickly that the graph that there are numbers x1 and x2. Those are different x values or input values. The y values must be different to be a one-to-one -one function. So if a horizontal line crosses the graph more than one point, then it's not a one-to-one -one function. So keep in mind, as we go through the next few examples, the definition states that if you have two different output values, then there must be two different input values. Otherwise, the function is not one-to-one. -one. So the idea of using a horizontal line to determine whether a graph actually represents a function that is one-to-one, -one, that's called the horizontal line test. So earlier we talked about the vertical line test. The vertical line test is used to determine if the graph actually represents a function. It is choose one x value and see if you have more than one y value or output value. A horizontal line test actually says this. A function is one-to-one -one if and only if you can draw a horizontal line that does not intersect the graph more than once. So if you draw a horizontal line that intersects the graph more than one point, that is one y value for a horizontal line. If it's one y value, it must have exactly one x value to be a one-to-one -one function. If it hits the graph more than once, 
So if it hits the graph at x equals x1, and it hits the graph whenever x is equal to x2, so this graph of the function is not a one-to-one -one function. It fails the horizontal line test. So if you have x1 and x2 are different x values, they must be different y values, but the horizontal line is just one y value. So if it hits that horizontal line more than once, it's not a one-to-one -one function. But again, notice that this graph does pass the vertical line test, so it is a function. It's just not a one-to-one -one function using the horizontal line test. So in example one, we're going to apply the horizontal line test to determine which of the following graphs actually have inverse functions. In other words, which of the following graphs are one-to-one -one functions. So this first graph, it's a linear function. It's a straight line, and it will pass the vertical line test to be a function, but it also passes the horizontal line test. So any horizontal line I draw will hit the graph only once. And so it's a one-to-one -one function. So a linear function does have an inverse function. However, notice we talked about a graph that is a parabola, a U-shaped graph, or in this case, it's an upside-down U-shaped graph. That graph represents a quadratic function. A quadratic function does not have an inverse function because any horizontal line I draw will hit the graph more than one point. So this one y value has two different x values. So it's not a one-to-one -one function. Same thing for the third graph. If I draw a horizontal line anywhere on the graph and it intersects more than once, it does not have an inverse. It's not a one-to-one -one function. So this third graph fails the horizontal line test. I can draw a horizontal line that crosses the graph three times. So it's not a one-to-one -one function. But then the last graph is a one-to-one -one function. Any horizontal line I draw will hit the graph exactly one point. And so that graph will have an inverse for that function. So the horizontal line test is a really quick check to see if you actually have the graph of the function and you want to find out does that function actually have an inverse, then you want to use the horizontal line test. If the horizontal line crosses more than once, then the graph of that function, that function doesn't have an inverse. It's not one-to-one. -one. So let's say you actually do have a function that's one-to-one. -one. So let's now talk about what does it mean to be an inverse of a function. One-to-one -one functions are really important because we talked about previously that these are the functions that actually have inverses. So the definition of inverse of a function, we have inverse operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, powers, and roots, but there are inverses of functions too. But the functions that have inverses are one-to-one. -one. So the definition of an inverse of a function, let f of x be a one-to-one -one function, so it does have an inverse, with domain A and range B, its inverse function is denoted this way f, and then don't think of the negative one as an exponent. The negative one is just indicating it's the inverse function. So it's f inverse of x, or inverse of f of x. This function has a domain b and range a. So notice that the function f, the domain was a and the range was b, but the inverse function has that reversed. The domain is b and the range is a. So if the function actually has f of x is equal to y, so you input the x value into the function f and the output value is y, that means with inverses that you input the y value, so you input y into the inverse function, and you'll output the original x. And so y is now going to be an input value for the inverse function, and x is going to be the output value for the inverse function. And so the set of input values for the inverse those are y values. Well, those were the range of the original function f. So if they're input values, those values are coming from the domain of the inverse. And the same reason, x is an output value for the inverse. Well, the x's were from the domain of the original function f. So the domain of the original function f are the output values of your inverse or the range of the inverse. So in other words, if the function f takes x to y, which is what this indicates, if you input x, you output y, then the inverse function will undo that. It will take the y value and send it back to the x. So it will take y back to the original x value. That can only occur if you have a one-to-one -one function though. So that's why we have one-to-one -one functions are really important. Those are the ones that have inverse functions. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is an arrow diagram where you actually can illustrate a function and its functions inverse. So you're going to see that the inverse function, the inverse function of y, will actually reverse the effect of the original function f of x. And so we're going to find out in the arrow diagram that if you have f of 3 is equal to 7, you input x equals 3, you output y equals 7. x equals 3 is an input, y equals 7 is the output, 
the inverse function will undo that. It'll send the y value back to x. So you input y equals 7 into the inverse function, and the output is the x equals 3. So y equals 7 is the input value for the inverse, and x equals 3 is the output value for the inverse. So as we just explained, the domain of the function f, that's the set of all input values for the function f. Those are x values. So you input x and you output y values. Well, y values are in the range of the original function f of x. But if you're talking about inverse functions, you input y values into your inverse function. Well, that's the domain of the inverse function. Those are the set of all input values, f inverse of y. Well, those send those y values back to x. Well, the output value is x. That's the range of the inverse function. So we have this property that relates the domain of the original function and the range of the inverse function. And the range of the original function f of x is the domain of the inverse function of y. So let's look at example two. You have an arrow diagram that actually is representing the original function and an arrow diagram representing the inverse function. So let f of x be a one-to-one -one function. If f of one is equal to five, f of 3 is equal to 7, and f of 8 is equal to negative 10, then you have this arrow diagram. So this is the domain of the function f of x. It takes x equals 1, and output is 5. It inputs x equals 3, and the output is 7. And you input 8, and you output negative 10 for the function f. The inverse function will just undo each of those. It will take y equals 5 and send it back to x equals 1. So that means f inverse of 5, so 5 is your input for the inverse function, your output is 1. So if f of 1 is 5, the inverse function of 5 is 1, and that's because f is a 1 to 1 function. The inverse of 7, so 7 is going to be input into the inverse function, you output x equals 3. And so f of 3 is 7 means that the inverse function of 7 sends it back to 3. And again, f is a 1 to 1 function. The inverse function of negative 10, so negative 10 is a y value, you input that into your inverse function, you output x equals 8 because f of 8 was negative 10. So f of 8 is negative 10 means the inverse function of negative 10 is 8. And again, f is a 1 to 1 function makes this all possible. So by the definition of the inverse function, the f inverse of y, it undoes what the original function f of x does. So if we start with an x value and we apply the function f of x, and then let's say we actually do a composite function and we apply the inverse function second, so f of x is the inside function of your composite function, but then the inverse function is the outside function. You input x, you get f of x, you input f of x, and now you're going to arrive back at the original x. And similarly, if you have the function f of x, it will undo what the inverse function does. So this is why inverse functions are unique. You only have one inverse function for any function that is one to one. So in general, any function that reverses the effect of the original function f of x, in this way, it must be the inverse function of f of x. So we have this property, which is called the inverse function property. Let f of x be a one-to-one -one function. The domain of f is a, and the range of f of x is b. The inverse function, f inverse of y, it will have domain b and range a. It will also satisfy the following properties. If you do composite functions or composition of functions, so if your inverse function is the outside function and your function f is the inside function, so you plug in x into your function f first, you get a y value, but then the inverse function will take that y value and send it back to x. And so composition of functions where you input x will send it back to x after both f and f inverse are applied. So that will be equal to x for any x value that's in the domain of f of x. And vice versa, if f is the outside function and the inverse of f is the inside function, you, well, you plug y values into the inverse function, you'll get an x value. Well, then you take f and you apply that to x, you'll send it back to y. And so that is true for every y value in the domain of the inverse function of y. So why is this so important? Well, these two properties actually give you a way to check whether two functions are inverse functions of one another. If you do composition of a function, and its supposed inverse function, you should get just whatever you plug in as the original input variable. So if you input x, you output x, or if you input y, you output y, if it's the inverse composition with the original function. So let's finish up with example three. We're going to verify whether two functions are actually inverse functions of one another. So show that the following two functions, f of x and g of x, are inverse functions of one another.
So if you have an inverse function, it's unique. So you only have one inverse function for any given one-to-one -one function. Let's say f of x is 2x plus 3, and g of x is 1 half times the quantity x subtract 3. Let's see if these two are actually inverse functions of one another or not. So if they are inverses of one another, you can do composition of functions in any order, and you actually have just x. So you can have f on the outside, g of x, which we think might be the inverse function, and try to see if you get x. If you input x, you apply g first, and then you get the answer, and then you apply f to that. If you originally plugged in x and you get x as the output after composition, those two functions are inverses of one another, or vice versa. If you have g on the outside, which we think might be the inverse function, and f is the inside function, if you apply f to x first, and then you apply g second, and you end up with x again, you input x, output x after composition, the two functions are inverse of one another. So let's check that. Let's try f of g of x, so composition of two functions. Well, we know what g of x is, that's the inside function in this case. We're going to substitute in 1 half times the quantity, x minus 3, into the outside function f of x. So wherever you see an x, that's now going to be g of x, whenever we do this composition of functions. It'll be f of 1 half times the quantity x minus 3, that'll be 2 times input value, well that's 1 half times x minus 3 in parentheses, and then we want to add 3 outside the parentheses. So now simplify. You have 2 times a half, well that's 1, so then 1 times x minus 3 is x minus 3, and then you have plus 3. Notice that you have these inverse operations acting on one another. Multiply by 2 and divide by 2, those are inverse operations of one another, and then we have subtract 3 and plus 3, those are also inverse operations. And so yeah, you do just get x after doing composition of f of x and g of x. f composed with g of x just gives you x. That means f of x and g of x are inverse functions of one another. So let's try g of f of x. So this time f of x is the inside function and g of x is the outside function. So we're going to substitute the inside function f of x into your outside function g of x this time. So g of f of x was 2x plus 3, so we're going to substitute 2x plus 3 into the outside function g of x. And so we'll have 1 half times the input value. Well, the input is 2x plus 3 now, so it'll be 2x plus 3, and then subtract 3. So again, look for the inverse operations. We should see those undo each other. So inside the parentheses first, we have a plus 3 and subtract 3, that's 0. And then you'll have 1 half times 2x. That just simplifies to just x again. So again, you have g of x and f of x are inverse functions of one another. f of x's inverse is g of x and the inverse of g of x is f of x. So this is a good place to stop our video now that we talked about one-to-one -one functions and we also talked about the inverse of a function and actually how to verify whether two functions are inverses of one another. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about how to find the inverse of a function.